بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي اخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء احوى اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحزن سهلا اذا شئت اللهم انا نسالك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى او العفاف والغنى اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم انا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessings and salutations upon our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam blessings upon all his companions and upon the four illustrious imams Blessings upon all those who have followed them and are following them and will follow them until the day of Qiyamah. May Allah include all of us to be from amongst them. Amen. O oh Allah, we do not have knowledge besides that which you have granted us, for indeed you are the owner of knowledge most wise. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us knowledge that will be beneficial. And indeed we seek, that, we seek from you that you benefit us from whatever knowledge you have granted us. Ya Allah, we seek your protection from knowledge that is of no use, from eyes that will not cry for your sake, from a heart that will not tremble in your fear, and from a stomach or soul that will not be filled or content. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all contentment and happiness in the dunya and the akhirah. Honored ulama, beloved brothers and dearest listeners, once again I say, speaking the truth, it brings great humbleness and humility to myself to be speaking in a masjid that... Great scholars have spoken in, in fact, moments ago I heard that one of the scholars of deen, one of our akabirin, was actually here this afternoon by the name of Mufti Farooq from Mirat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him a long and healthy life. For your information, he is one of the senior most khalifas of Mufti Mahmud al-Hassan Saab Gangohi rahmatullahi tabaraka wa ta'ala alayhi. And I feel like it was a great loss that I could not make it this afternoon here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance. The topic that was chosen for me for this evening is the role of parents when it comes to the children's upbringing. And I will dive straight into the topic and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept me to utter words that are of relevance to all of us, including myself. Sometimes people ask me saying, do you know the situation in our community? Because the way you spoke, it seemed like someone told you something. I don't like people who tell me things generally. And normally I don't know the situation. But through the experience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to achieve of very few years, not much. Normally the problems of Banu Adam are similar. Shaitan uses the same plan to drop me and to drop you and to drop the others. We find the issue of hasad and ghiba and the issue of all these other items. If we are to speak about them, everyone is affected. Nowadays, when you speak about jadu, everyone's ears are twitched and they all listen to you carefully because everyone seems to be blaming everyone else, especially the women folk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this grave crime. The grave crime of what? Of suspecting people of having done jadu and thinking that any cough you have is jadu. That is a grave crime. Now imagine if that is a kabira, what about the one who really does the jadu? It is even worse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us, our marriages, our offspring from thinking of inflicting jadu upon anyone and from also thinking that someone else has done something to us. Nine times out of ten, it is not the case. Also, before I move on, since I am on the topic of jadu, I was thinking to myself this afternoon when someone phoned me and asked me a question connected to this topic. I thought, why is it that the world blames bad on jadu? Why don't we use it to do good? Na'udhu billah. What, what that means is, people who want happiness in their marriages, they are blaming jadu for them not to be happy. The day they are happy, why then don't they blame jadu? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the true understanding. Let's develop our taqwa and iman. And let's develop our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fact 
that he is the only one who is in control of happiness and sadness and so on and everything that is going on. Everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَضُرُّوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَضُرُّوكَ أَوْ لَنْ يَضُرُّوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ According to a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says you should know that even if the entire ummah gathers all together to try to harm you, wallahi qasaman, they will never be able to inflict even a drop against you unless Allah has written it against you. So may Allah grant us the sabr regarding that which we have been affected and inflicted with and may Allah make it easy for us. Similarly, one narration Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us through the tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا أَصَابَكَ لَمْ يَكُلْ لِيُخْطِئَكَ وَمَا أَخْطَعَكَ لَمْ يَكُلْ لِيُصِيبَكَ That which got to you was never ever meant to miss you. It was aimed at you, fired direct. And that which missed you, even with a fraction, some say that a bullet darted past my eyes and it was meant and shot at me. It was never ever meant to get to you. Even if the person came point blank, it was never meant to get to you. So that is the taqwa and yaqeen we need to develop in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of us, alhamdulillah, we are the children of someone. Do we make dua for our parents? That's a question. No matter how old you are, whether your parents are alive or passed away. Do we make dua for our parents? If we don't, let's rectify it. Let's start making dua for our parents on a daily basis, whether they are hayat or mamat, whether they are alive or they've passed away. Similarly, have we ever made dua for our grandparents? Those whom we have not seen also? Bab Dada, those who are gone? Wallahi, it is a point of merit to make dua for our grandparents, especially when we know their names and the fact that they were Muslimin. In the case where they are non-Muslims, there are other rules and regulations which I don't want to get into. But here I am speaking about those who know their parents, their grandparents, and possibly even their great-grandparents. And you know they are Muslimin in their qubur. Spend a minute a day, two minutes a day, Ya Allah, grant maghfira to all my forefathers who are Muslimin, male and female. And make their qabrs, make their graves, gardens from amongst the gardens of paradise. Why do I raise the topic of being a parent? Because that's the topic today. The role of parents when it comes to the children. It's a very interesting topic. Very interesting topic. Maulana Masihullah Sabz, one of his senior khalifas known as Mufti Inayat Londoni. He's from London. He is the one who led the Salatul Janaza of Maulana Masihullah Khan Sab, Jalal Abadi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him nur in his qabr. He recently spoke on a similar topic. And today I'm going to mention a few points that he mentioned. Those are our kabirin. And coupled with that, a hadith insha'Allah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and lessons that we learn from that. Look, each one of us, we have parents and each one of us, we are probably parents ourselves or we expect to be parents. And if Allah has not granted you children, we make a dua here and now. Ya Allah, those who do not have children and they are married, Ya Allah, grant them offspring. I mean, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. I know of people who've given birth after eight years of marriage, they are, they are Allah granted them a child. After 12 years, after 14 years, maybe yours is also eight years, 10 years. Don't lose hope. And don't employ haram methods to get a child. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really and truly grant us the understanding. The Quran says, يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثًا وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورُ أَوْ يُزَوِّجُهُمْ ذُكْرَانًا وَإِنَاثًا وَيَجْعَلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ عَقِيمًا Allah grants whomsoever He wishes female children only. Whomsoever He wishes, He grants only male children. Whomsoever He wishes, he gives them both, male and female. And whomsoever he wishes, he gives them neither, male nor female. That is Allah. And Allah creates also in four ways. He has created through neither male nor female, such as Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. When we speak to the Christians, this is what we, we tell them. Four ways of creation. No male, no female involvement, such as Adam alayhi salam. Kun fayakun. Be and it was. 
through the male without the interference of a female. Allah has created Hawa alayha as salatu was salam. No female was involved. It was Adam alayhi salam. We don't say he gave birth to Hawa, but we say Hawa was created through him, as is mentioned in the ahadith, even in the Quranic verse at the beginning of Surah An Nisa. Some of the Mufassirin translated that way. So that is the second method. The third method is Isa alayhi salatu was salam was given birth without the interference of any male, which means only female. So one we saw no male, no female. One we saw male, no female. One we saw female, no male. Qudratul bari jalla wa ala. That is the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thereafter myself and yourselves, both male and female. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us that He is all powerful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand His greatness and to adopt and surrender to His commands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. So we were created through male and female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept a system in place that nobody here and nobody ever has applied that Ya Allah, I am a soul in Alamul Arwah. And I want a parent when I come onto the earth who is going to be of this color, he's going to be living in Stanga, he's going to have a Mercedes, he's going to send me to the best school, and he's going to give me a cell phone. No one has ever applied. There's no application forms, nothing. It is Allah's divine, supreme, and sole decision who will be your parent. He decided that your father is going to be so and so. I want to create you. You are my worshiper. But the means through which I am going to bring you into the dunya is this and that. Finished. You don't have a decision. And Allah decides also sometimes that your mother and father might divorce after your birth. It might be the case. That was Allah's decision. That you were going to be born into a home where the mother and father were going to die when you are at the age of two. May Allah have mercy on our orphans in the ummah. And may Allah have mercy on those who are suffering in homes of cases where divorce has taken place. And may Allah make us Muslimin, which means those who can surrender to the command of Allah when He says custody will be with this side and access will be with the other side. We must surrender to it male and female. Don't ever contest the decision of Allah and think that you are going to fix up your ex-wife or ex-husband by changing their names un-Islamically, number one, or by prohibiting and stopping the access or custody that Allah has decided through the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's very important. So Allah has decided whom you are going to be born to, what color, where, what part of the world, what financial level the family will be, how much of that you will, you will bring into the dunya, you come with your own risk and sustenance. That is why in Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Tazawwaju al-waduda al-waluda fa'inni mukathirun bikum al-umama yawm al-qiyamah. And in one narration, fa'inni mubahim bikum al-umama yawm al-qiyamah. Get married to women who are loving and childbearing and they love to bear children. Because I would like to be through you. That Nabi who has the greatest number of ummatis, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant the women folk the acceptance to understand that giving birth is a jihad, it is fi sabilillah. And if you die, you die a martyr whilst you are dying in pregnancy or childbirth or related sicknesses to the reproductive system. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant the men folk the understanding that the stretch marks that are found on the bellies of their women folk who have given birth are marks of honor. And the fact that they have contributed to one of the greatest sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not be disheartened and turn away from your wife just because of an inch of flab that has developed on her belly. Because of the fact that she bore your own child following this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many men are guilty of turning away from their own wives after a certain age because we have a sickness in us and I'm going to come to that sickness later on in this lecture, but I want to mention it now, just in case I forget. In the same way, when a mobile phone comes out, we want the latest model. When the cars come out, we change it every year. That is a sickness. That is a disease. 
If your mobile phone is serving your purpose, why do you want to change it so regularly? If your motor vehicle is serving your purpose, why do you want to change it so regularly? Why do you run behind the dunya so much? We are not saying it is haram to have the best car. No, don't misunderstand me. But when you have a lalach of these things that you run behind them and you follow the latest trends and, and the latest items and issues and you change and develop accordingly and you got no other danda, you got nothing else to do, then it becomes a sickness which will also seep into your marriage. You'll want another wife after a few years. Because she is 1960 model. Who wants to drive a 1960 car here? No one. So we must learn to control. I am not saying do not change your motor vehicles. I am not saying, but when the need arises, when you have to, maybe once every two years, if you are rich enough to do that, if you feel that now is the time when the car is meant to be serving me, I will use it. But the minute I have to start serving the car, then I will sell it up. But sometimes it happens with women folk. So don't get me wrong there also. Because what happens is after a certain age, the only thing you smell in the room is Vicks. May Allah grant us the understanding. <laughs> but it can happen to us also. The men folk, it happens to them also. That must not lead you away from your own women folk. Wallahi, it is high time we, especially the men, learned how to talk in the house. The sweetest Aisha radiallahu anha used to boast about how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to eat. Let me mention one point. Just one point. The reason why I'm saying this, to develop your qualities as a parent and to create happiness in the home is the first step in the success of the children that are resultant. If there is no happiness in the home, you don't know how to live with your own wife. What do you want your children to learn? You must smile as an act of worship. Every time you smile, you must know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's Sunnah, which he mentioned in Sahih Ahadith, no one on the globe will argue with you. Tabassumuka fi wajhi akhi ka sadaqa. To smile at the face of your fellow Muslim brother is a sadaqa. What about your own wife who's closer than that brother? And what about your own husband? So when you walk in the house, even if the food is smelling burnt, for the sake of fulfilling a sunnah, break into a smile. Allahu Akbar, it will solve 20 of your problems. Smile twice, thrice. Another thing, Allah says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidatil hasana. I'm sure we understand the verse. Call to the path of Allah, who? Either the weak Muslims or even the non Muslims. With hikmah and with beautiful speech. What about your own wife and husband? Who's the closest to you? You want to tell them something? Why did you burn the clothes, for example? Now that is what? That is something light. It is not a big sabilillah. So, it brings me to what Maulana Asadullah Saab, who was the former Muhtamim of Darulum Saharanpur, Mazahirulum, many, many years ago, when Maulana Zakaria Saab Rahmatullah used to teach there, he used to call the students who used to graduate and he used to remind them of a story. And I want all of you to remember this, very important. He says, Deko, listen, you are going, you are ulama graduating, you are going to people, you are going to the various communities of yours. I want you to listen to one verse, he says. He says one day, in fact, before he, the verse, it's actually a qissa, where there was a man, I forget his name now, he went to Harun al-Rashid. He went to Harun al-Rashid al-Khalifa, rahimahullah. And he uttered a statement. He uttered a statement, and in fact, to be very honest with you, I'm not sure if Harun al-Rashid told him or if he told Harun al-Rashid. But the statement is as follows. There was a heated, there was something that was going wrong and it was corrected in a very severe way. So the statement that was uttered was, listen, and this is the nasiha of Maulana Asadullah Sahib as well, rahimahullah. He says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salatu wassalam to Fir'aun, who was Musa and who was Fir'aun? Musa alayhi salatu wassalam and his brother Harun were the best at the time. He was a Nabi. He was a Nabi, the best of the time. And Fir'aun was the worst, worse than anyone ever thereafter, maybe besides Abu Jahl and a few people who damaged Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam or tried to damage him physically and, and in other ways as well. But he was the Abu Jahl of that time there, Fir'aun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi ma as salam, 
فقولا له قولا لينا لعله يتذكر أو يخشى. When you go to him, speak with speech that is layin, soft, beautiful, so that maybe he can remember something and understand that he is not Allah, I am Allah. Speak to him with the best of words. That's what the Quran says. That's what Allah told Musa alayhi salam. So the message is, Mawlana Asadullah Sahib is saying, none of you are better than Musa alayhi salam. And nobody ever who you will talk to can ever be worse than Fir'aun. So you are supposed to be speaking to them even in a better manner. Did we understand the point? None of you can ever be better than Musa alayhi salam. And no one you ever trying to call to deen can be worse than Fir'aun. So watch your speech even further. Allahu Akbar. Look at this nasiha. Now today, how do we call our Muslims to deen? I don't even have to go further. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us really to serve the deen positively, to solve the problems, rather than just to mention and blurt the problems without even presenting solutions and helping those who have problems. So I was saying husband-wife relation is extremely important, very, very important. We need to smile. Do not lose your cool. Do not lose your temper. Don't let shaitan come and spoil this relation. But sometimes nowadays there is a new problem. What is the problem? By the parents will tell you, my son, my daughter got married, but they didn't even consult me. They didn't even consult me. That is a sickness also. Unless your parents are un-Islamic, unless your parents are those who really have, have gone astray, you should try your best always to make mashwara with your parents. Allah has chosen them for you to come into the dunya. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفِّهُ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ رُحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا سبحان الله Allah says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that you shall worship none besides him. قَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ And thereafter, what shall you do? Once you are a good Muslim who has followed and submitted to the command of Allah, which was taught to us through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means deen comes first. And thereafter come your parents. That is the second order. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't even utter to them, uh, or oh, oof, sometimes your mother tells you, pick up the plate after you and you say, tss, just that, tss, that's what is being spoken about in the Quran. How does it hurt that parent, that mother gave birth to you? The mother carried you for nine months. You were so heavy. You made her literally suffer morning sickness. That's why Allah says that it is not easy to, to bear a child. If Allah wanted, those sicknesses would not be there. But Allah kept those sicknesses, some of the ulama say, so that a child who is farma bardar, that child who is obedient, can think that my mother's been through a lot. Just the act of childbirth, the birth itself, the labor. Wallahi, if men were to go through it, I, I don't even know what would happen. And yet we are born... We are looked after at a time by our parents when had they forsaken us, we would have died. When a child screams, that child's mother runs to the child. Had the mother not run to the child, maybe the child might have suffocated in one way or another. But had that mother known that 18 years down the line, this child is going to slap me in my face. Do you really think that that mother would have run? The answer is yes, the mother would still have run. Hoping that inshallah he won't do that or she won't do that. That is the rahmah Allah has put in a mother. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed one lady breastfeeding, he stopped his companions and asked them, do you see the mercy that this mother has on the child? Do you think that she would ever throw the child into the fire? 
And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, Kalla, never ever, it's impossible. And he told them, Wallahi, I tell you, the mercy of Allah is far greater than this mother can ever have on that child. May Allah save us from the punishment of Jahannam. What that means is the mother. We might disobey the mother after some time. May Allah not make us from amongst those. And may Allah not give us mothers who will order us that which is wrong and haram. We need to balance the coin here also. And at the same time, that mother will still make dua for you. The mother will still be good to you. The mother will still look after you, get you up, literally clean you when you are in the most dirty of positions and most dirty of conditions. Having a hope, inshallah, that one day you will grow up to be someone fine who will be an asset to his or her own parents. But then, few years down the line, we marry. When we marry, nowadays, na'udhu billah. The minute you marry your wife, you divorce your mother. I'm not saying you were married to your mother. But you can't trade the two in. It's not a motor vehicle that you trade one in and you get another. No. And the mothers also don't think that now you've lost your child to someone else. No, there is no war between the two. There is no fight. There is tawafuq. There must be compatibility between the two. We must congratulate and welcome our daughters-in-law in the house. And we must understand that the son might not be able to spend that much time with us because of one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided. And that is marriage. So there is a balance that is required, but we need to make dua for our parents. We need to be good to them. We need to look after them. And the male folk, it is our duty primarily to look after our parents. May Allah make us from amongst those whose parents can be proud of. And may Allah make us from amongst those really who can be an asset within the family, within the community, within the society, within the city, within the country, and within the Muslim ummah at large. Let's move on. Umar radiallahu anhu was once faced with a man who came to him and told him, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, my son is very disobedient. I want you to tell him a few things. They brought the son. He admonished the son for quite a while, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu, saying, This is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. When he finished, This child asked Amir al Mu'minin, saying, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, I thank you for your words. You have told me all the rights that my father has over me. But I want to ask you one question What rights do I have over my father, or do I not have any? That's a question. The father's listening. What rights do I have over my father? He said, yes, you have some rights. And he only mentioned a few. I want to mention just three. He says, the first right, oh young boy, that your father, that you have over your father, is that, imagine it's a very difficult one. The first right is that he should have married a pious woman. Imagine. That's the first right of your children. Now, why am I mentioning this now? Because we're talking about marriage and so on and wives. You need to choose a good wife. That is the right your children who are unborn have over you. Allahu Akbar. So from this we learn, my dear brothers and sisters, those who are not married, when you are looking for a spouse, don't look for the next most pretty woman on the street. Don't look for the next most wealthy girl in Stanger. Look for the mother of your children who can bring up those children according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or as close as possible. That is the criteria. And my dear sisters who may be listening, when looking for a husband, look for the father of your children. Think to yourself, I need a mother. She might be have one inch this side or that side, a bit more in body terms. You don't have to have a figure like a trigger, because as I always say, that trigger can be pulled sometime and you will be shot. But we need to look for the mothers of our children. When you are marrying, look for someone whom, inshallah, when you are not there, she will look after you. Meaning she will look after your interests. She will be a person who is faithful to you and so on. There are many rights. But the prime point I'm raising here, the right that your unborn children, you might not have children later on. 
And we make a dua once again, Ya Allah, those who don't have children, they are married, Ya Allah, grant them offspring, who will be the coolness of their eyes. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. But at the same time, it's your duty to get married to someone who is reasonable, who knows deen, someone who is of a compatibility level. Before I mention the other two points regarding what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu told this young man, something has come to my mind. You know, we all hear the verse, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahum. Regarding wives, Allah says, They are like garments unto you, and you are like garments unto them. They are like garments unto you, and you are like garments unto them. I've heard lots of ulama and I've read lots of kitabs where this is explained. The best explanation I've come across, I want to share it with you today. Allah is describing your wife as clothes for you. And Allah is describing you as clothes for her. That's the example. Allah says they are like clothes. So let's analyze it. Do you think an example that Allah gives can be wrong in any way? When you want to buy clothes, can you buy a size that's not yours? You are size 10 and you want to buy size 8. It won't fit. You'll tear it. Divorce in one month, in a few days. A very important lesson regarding clothes. When you're looking for clothing, what do you look? When you tailor make your clothing, can you tell the tailor, look, I'm size 10, but leave 10 inches here and 10 inches that side. I might get fat in the future. No, that is clothing. It must fit you. From that we learn something in the Sharia known as compatibility. And in Deen, you are looking for someone who's slightly higher than you so that you can actually learn and you can actually come. And on both part, on both sides, we should be looking for someone slightly better than us. One might say, well, how do you work that out? You work it out, you'll find it, inshallah. Because the exact level of deen is not known by anyone besides Allah and, and the person who is involved. I can't judge, you can't judge me, I can't judge you exactly what level of deen. Deen doesn't have a gauge like the speedometer that goes up to 220 on some of these big roads. May Allah grant us understanding. So, hunna libasul lakum, like clothing. Let me take you a little bit further with this clothing here. Very interesting point. What does clothing do to you? When it's very cold, what do you do? You wear clothing so that you can be protected from adverse weather. What that means is, in marriage also, your husband, the husband must be with the wife and the wife must be with the husband in such a manner that you protect each other from the onslaught of outside. Those external damages that people are trying to inflict, you cover each other. You protect each other. That is libas. Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahun. In winter, you have winter clothes. In summer, you have summer clothes. I hope they are not the clothes of the kuffar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us libasul taqwa at all times. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with the way we dress. So, in the same way that it will protect you from adverse weather, hot and cold, when the situation is heated in the house, your husband is expected to stand up for you at least. Utter one word. Even if you have a misunderstanding with your wife, you don't have to go outside to tell the people she's like this and like that because that won't solve your problem, it will make it worse. And the same applies to the wife. She should never go out to tell her friends and others to say he's like this and like that. That won't solve your problem, it will make it worse. Your clothing covers you, it covers you. In fact, another point, when you have an ill, say I've had a big operation from the top to the bottom. Who knows about it? I've, I've got clothes on. No one knows. My clothes are covering my, my marks. My blemishes. In the same way, when you are married, you will notice some things about your wife or husband that others don't notice. They won't notice. You must cover them. Only you and he or you and she knows it. No one else. That's the clothing. When I take out my clothing, does my clothing speak to people to say that? This is the mark that I was on just now a few minutes ago. And that also takes us all the way to divorce. The, the day a person divorces a woman, you don't have to speak bad about her. She doesn't have to speak bad about you. You didn't get on. People like to justify these days to say, no, I was right. She was wrong. Don't do that. So what? Just say we didn't get on. She's a very good person, but we didn't get on. We were different. There are good people who don't get on sometimes. Very good people, both. But they don't get on because they have different upbringings. So it also takes us to that. The hadith, another hadith says, Al-mu'minu mir'atul mu'min. When it comes to mu'minin, the, the description is not that of clothing because you don't wear each other like husband and wife. To wear, clothing is very intimate. 
It is, a, it is describing a very intimate relation. But when it comes to a mirror, you will find that you look into the mirror, that is the only time you will be able to rectify what's wrong with you. You have something wrong here, there, a big mark. You will look in the mirror and you will see it. If you don't look into the mirror, you are not going to see it. And when you go away, the mirror doesn't show your image to others. It rectifies you. It rectifies your ill. And it will not talk to someone else. When someone else comes, it talks about their illness, not yours. Your, if you, our images got stuck on the mirrors, none of us would have mirrors in the bathroom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So let's move further. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu mentioned the first point. I hope we remember it. That one of the rights that you have over your father is that he marries a pious woman for yours. Meaning he marries a pious woman. The second is when you were born, it was his duty to give you a good name. To give you a good name. The third is when you learned how to speak, when you learned initially how to read, how to speak, how to utter, the first things he should teach you is the Quran and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this young man said, looked at his father, looked at Umar ibn al-Khattab and said, my mother, my father married a slave girl, first point. The second point, he kept my name something, very bad meaning. And up to now, he hasn't taught me a word of the Quran. Umar ibn al-Khattab transferred the admonishment from the boy to the father. Why? Because the parents did not, the parent did not fulfill his basic duties towards his own child. Sometimes you might make a mistake in one right, but you can rectify it. The next thing, you can rectify it. Someone might have married the wrong person. Now you married. Don't go home and say, Mufti Sahib says, now we must separate. No. That's wrong. That's an immature way of looking at it. But you can rectify it. Now, the next step, make sure that you name the child properly. Make sure you, you create a link between your children and ulama. Even if you might not have a link, you develop your own link. Because remember, the best way to teach your children, and that brings me to another point, is by example. We have women folk who like to dress in un-Islamic ways. How do you want your daughters to dress? Then suddenly you see her, she's going to dress worse than you. Because qarni, alunahum, alunahum. The hadith of Rasulullah says, the best of people, my generation. And then the next, and then the next, and so on. So generally, the, the movement is becoming worse than better. Today we have lots of Muslims. Alhamdulillah, in the globe there are more beards than they ever were in history. Nowhere in history were there this number of masjids, count them. Nowhere in history were there this number of women in Parda. But now we need to concentrate over and above that on the quality, inshallah. We need to develop these internal weaknesses that we have, work on our hearts. That's where tasawwuf comes into being, into play. We need to really rectify our, the hatred, the jealousy, the malice, the deception, and all these things, the, the, the love of ourselves that we have. We need to take these things out. Don't regard yourself, I am something. The minute you think you are better than someone, you become worse than them. Just by that thought. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us taraqqi and upliftment. So, as I was saying, to lead by example, if the lady of the house is not going to, for example, dress properly, how does she want her daughter to dress? If she is on the phone, ha ha, he he, whole day with other men, what does she want her daughters to do when they have a mobile phone? If her SMSs are beeping at all odd hours and she looks at that mobile and smiles and blushes, even the young daughters know what's going on. And by the way, the mobile phone is one of the biggest destroyers of marriages today. I'm telling you because I do marriage counseling as well. And I'm sure those who do it here and who know, they will tell you, yes, it is true. It's so easy to destroy a marriage. There was one lady who phoned and says, you know, my husband and I are really having a bad time. And now it's on the brink of breaking. I said, what's happened? She said, it's me to blame. I'm surprised. Women normally don't blame themselves. She said, it's me to blame. I said, what went wrong? She said, you know, he was happily married to someone else. Very happy. And I really wanted him. So what I did, four anonymous calls to that woman of his, the wife who was an innocent lady, four anonymous calls and the marriage was broken. And three weeks later, I was married to her, uh, to him. And now he found out some time later what had happened that time. Now he doesn't want me anymore. Obviously he won't want her. 
So she says, I asked for it. But the reason I tell you, she says, is for you to inform others that firstly, don't allow people like me to break your marriages. Don't believe anonymous calls. Anonymous is shaitan, Iblis bi'aynihi. Iblis himself. That is who an anonymous call is. They'll tell you, I'm a well-wisher. I saw your husband doing this. That is Iblis. Wanting you to break. It's so easy. If you believe that, it's a cancer that has no cure besides cutting it out. That's it. That's anonymous. Where did Islam teach us that you must correct a, a, a weakness through anonymous letters, anonymous calls, anonymous this? That is an un-Islamic way of doing things. You want... كُنُوا قَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِسْطَ You want, you must stand up and bear witness for the sake of Allah with your name and surname. Let them see who you are. That is a true person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Also those who come to you and say, look, I'll tell you something, but don't mention my name. Why not? Who? Are you not a human being? Why do you not want your name to be mentioned? Maybe you are adding masala and mirch that is causing the diarrhea everywhere. It is happening. So we need to maintain these marriages. Let's not believe others. And the point that I had diverted from was that point of the mobile phone. And the fact that we need to lead by example. When the father in the home himself has shady deals, he screams and shouts and swears at his own wife. Those children are going to do the same. So the parents need to teach the children the best and quickest way is to teach those children through example. And I can prove that from a hadith. If you are willing to listen to me for a little while and concentrate deeply, you, are, you will understand what we are saying. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us to lead by example. And he says in a very important hadith, which I'm sure a lot of us do know, Muru abna'akum aw muru awladakum bis salati wa hum abna'u khamsi sinin aw sab'i sinin sab'i sinin wa hum abna'u sab'i sinin wadribuhum alayha yani ala salah wa hum abna'u ashri sinin He says command your children to read salah at the age of seven That's what the hadith says Now if I look at that hadith that to me means lead by example. How? Are you trying to tell me that Islam teaches you that your child must not read Salah until the age of seven? Is that what, you are is that what you, someone wants to understand from that hadith? That's a wrong understanding. The hadith starts at the age of seven. To say, you talk to them and command them at the age of seven. But that does not mean that before the age of seven, you must just let go. Let them see you reading Salah. If they see you at the age of one, one and a half, they'll also go in Sijda. Just by watching you. If they watch you wearing parda when you go out, they will want to wear a parda just like yours. I want to be like mommy. They will cry to wear a dress like yours. But when they see you with a miniskirt or with a jean and so on, then they will want to do the same. So you choose what you want. The same applies with those who dress Islamically. Wallahi, the children at the age of one and two will cry to dress like you. We, I'm sure we all know that. Who taught the child how to go into sajda at the age of one and two? We've seen it. I think 100% of us have seen it. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through that leading by example of the parents. So when they read salah five times a day, the women folk at home, mashallah, they are seen reading salah. The little children, they will come and they will also go and they will also say Allahu Akbar. When they hear the adhan, they will also make adhan after that. Who taught them that? But now... At the age of seven, you start commanding them now, commanding. At the age of ten, you're allowed to beat also. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and, and our children pardon with salah, for that is the key to the door of Jannah. And speaking about the key to the door of Jannah, every key has teeth. So make sure you also have five teeth. Sometimes we want to, we, we, we might get to Jannah, we want to open the door. And we might find that we only have four teeth. Because Fajr, we missed it. Only four teeth. There's another example that I give just for the benefit of those who are here. We always say that Allah has given us really a direct link to Him. And the number to dial is, as they always say, 24434. Four, four. We're talking of the rakats of the salahs. We're talking of the rakats of the salahs. 2443 four, and 4. What is happening to us today? We're dialing international, zero, zero. That's how we start. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not far. He is right near. We start with two, four, four. And I'm only talking of the farad. Obviously, the sunnah and that is also a requirement of the sharia. May Allah make us pardon with the sunnah as well. So, that was just an example. If you are going to lead by example in your house, you will find the children will follow. But if you are not an example, you can't expect the children to follow. Let me move further. And I'm actually diverting slightly. It's the same topic, but a different angle now. You know, if someone goes for Hajj, and they tell you, Rabbi, that's the key of my car. Warm it up every morning. And I'll come back in four weeks, six weeks. I hope the packages are cheap, inshallah. And, and inshallah, then you can give me back the motor vehicle. What are you going to do? Can you change his mags and spray paint the car and redo this and take the, 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 the seats out and put other seats and everything? Can you do that? Why can't you do it? Why? Because it's an amana. It is somebody's amana. He only told you, warm it, warm up the car. What you can do is you either warm up the car every day or you open his bonnet and clip off the battery so you don't even have to do that. So that the battery doesn't get flat also. The same applies to a house. Or let me speak about the car. But if it was your own car, are you allowed to change the, the tires? You can, because it's your discretion. Are you allowed to change the seats and to change the color and to change this and that? You're allowed because it's yours. You, you own it, basically. But someone else's, you can't. You must follow what they have said. Otherwise, it will be known as khiyana in the amana. For example, when they go and they give you the key of the house, can you rent it as a hotel now? When they come back, you made as much money as it costed them to go for Hajj. Can you do that? You can't. Because it's not your house. They just gave you to keep the key, maybe to take a turn there to make sure that the robbers haven't overtaken the home and so on. We know what is meant when I come and give you my key. We do it. All of us do it. We give you my key and say, Bye, that's my house keys. That means it shows that you're very close also because you've given them an amana. But can you now... Uh, destroy one wall, put his uh, kitchen somewhere else, take the shower out and put it that side there and do this. When he comes back from Hajj, he says, hey, what happened to my house? You can't do that because it's an amana. But if it was your own house, can you decide where the shower is going to be? You can because it's your house. Wallahi, our children are not property of ours. Our children are just an amana. Allah gives them to us in the same way and tells us, keep them for a little while. I'm going to take them back either in your life or after your life. But I want you to look after it and I'm going to get it back soon. That's it. So you can't change the child in a way that suits you, but in a way that Allah has asked you to do it. Do we see the example? That is the role of a parent is to fulfill the amana of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the role. We are the reason why I gave these two examples is to bring it closer to our heads. To say we understand it when a human gives us an amana. Why don't we understand when Allah gives us an amana? For that reason, my dear parents who are seated here, if Allah has taken your child away at an early age, it was like someone who came back from Hajj and asked for their house. It was Allah who gave you an amana and said, now I'm taking it back. All you've got to ask yourself in the interim, how did I look after this child? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. So that is an important point. We as parents and those who are parents, treat your children as an amana. And those who are children, remember, your parents will instruct you instructions that are at times very bitter to follow but they may only be doing that because of the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I were to tell you sleep you don't have to read Fajr it's easy but if I tell you get up it's more difficult it's bitter but that is where your success lies that is where your success lies I used to tell the children at Madrasa when I used to teach in the Maktab a few years ago and I used to say you know say at five o'clock in the morning, you find a snake under your bed. What will you do? They say, we'll scream and we'll shoot and we'll get out. Immediately, you shot out of your bed. So, if we still are sleeping at the time, isn't it that there might just be a snake in Jahannam waiting for us? May Allah save us. So, it's the same snake, but you can't see it. That's why you're not waking up. But there's a snake under there. Get up! Move! Bolt! As though there is some, if a human being who is a thug comes to you at three in the morning, Wallahi, you will shoot out of your bed, straight out. These are not thugs. This is the hukam of Allah. 
to get up for Salatul Fajr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us paband with Salatul Fajr. Very important. So our children are an amana and the children, we must understand that our parents have a duty. Let us help them to fulfill the duty. Now let me move to one of the last points I want to mention. If I have a glass and I fill water in it, when I drink, what's going in? Water. Can I suddenly be having juice going in and I filled water? This is a very important point. When I have a glass and I put milk in it and then I pour it out, what's going to come out of the glass? Milk. But if I have a glass and I pour in alcohol and then I want to pour it out or drink it, what's going to come out of it? Can water come out of it? No. Alcohol will come out. And, the, and one of the last examples I want to give you here is when I have a glass and I put milk in it, but together with that one drop of urine fell inside. When I pour it out, is it pak or napak? One drop, most of it was milk, 99.99%. One little drop of urine dropped in it, or even alcohol. Can I drink that? When it comes out, what will we say? Will we say this is milk? We won't say this is milk. It's not milk. It might be 99.9% .9 milk, but we'll say, hey, watch out, there's alcohol in there. That's, that's what we will say. Do we understand the example? Now, with our children, they are young. They are like empty glasses. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا وَيُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطَرَةِ Every child is born like an empty vessel, empty glass, upon nature, the hadith says. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ He says the parents would either make that child into a Jewish child, a Christian child or a fire worshipping child and in the case of the Muslimin, inshallah, we know that a Muslim child. So it is like an innocent, pure, empty glass. What? Ever you put into it, qasaman, that is the only thing that will come out of it. Don't think I will pour in alcohol, but water will come out of it. No. And if you have poured in milk, then inshallah, only milk will come out. What this means, when your child is small, if there is dhikrullah in the house, there are nice Quranic cassettes which are on in the house. When the child learns to talk, first things will be verses of the Quran. But if you have been swearing the F's and the B's and now the new swear words, starting with Y and Z and so on. Don't ask me because I don't know. I'm just saying it to shake your mind. These, all these swear words that are there today, if we utter them in the house, that is pouring urine or pouring alcohol into the glass. One day when you come home and you hear your small son swearing big F's and B's to his own mother. Why? Who taught the child? Now only you realized. But it was your fault. When the glass was empty, you the one who put it in. You the one who put it in. You're not fulfilling your role correctly. But if you have good akhlaq, when you want to tell your wife something that is a bit harsh, go into the privacy of your room, never in front of the children. That is, that is a right, not only do you owe to your wife, but even to your children. You are helping them to respect somebody there. That is right. And good akhlaq, salah, the times of salah, the dress, what you listen to, where you go, how you speak, how you deal. If you are dealing in those things which are wrong, bad people come into your house. Bad people come into your house. What do you expect? They're the friends of the children to be. Your business partners, if they are non-Muslims, say for example Hindus or Jews, may Allah save us all. You must know where to draw the line. They are not your mahrams just because they are your business partners. Even if they own 51% shares and you own 49, they don't become mahram with that. They are not welcome to open the doors of your house when you are not there. And even when you are there, there is a certain place of the house that they will sit in. Even if they are Muslims and even if they are good Muslims, you must know where to draw the line. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was faced with his wife, the most pure woman to exist, Aisha radiallahu anha, Humaira radiallahu anha. When he was faced with her being accused, what did he say? Man yaduruni fi rajulin, regarding the person who spread these accusations, who's going to excuse me? 
so that we can deal with this person here who has he has hurt me so much that he's got to my own family now, the hurt. And they are mentioning a man who is so good that everyone knows he's so good and pious and he has never been in my house unless I was with. That is what Rasulullah said. What does that mean? That is a sunnah to show no one must go to your house in your absence, not even to collect a jar of honey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Unless they are mahram. And these rules of Islam might sound primitive to those whose minds are contaminated with westernization. But wallahi, it is the only solution to our problems today. The only solution is to follow Islam in its totality, not just part of it. People might feel, no, you're being hard on us. Not being hard. It's a reality. We've seen homes breaking. The best friend having an affair with his best friend's wife or husband or so on. I know of a case whereby, and I hope it hasn't repeated itself here. Someone might say you were told. But a case whereby a sister ran away with the husband of her own sister. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. And in order for them to have done a nikah, he obviously had to, has to have had divorced that girl because they were sisters. May Allah grant us real, real and true understanding. So remember, our children, it's our duty. When we put the milk in the glass, milk will come out. We put water in the glass, water will come out. Whatever you teach the child, Allah, you teach the child, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sunnah, you teach the child respect of the ulama. If you respect the ulama, your children will automatically respect the ulama. You never ever seen speaking to even one alim, what do you want your children to do? Let them watch you, call them with you, let them stand. Rasulullah sallallahu in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Am kuntum shuhada'a idh hadara Ya'qub al-mawt. Were you present when Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam, when death came to him? We were not there, nor was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there. So Allah tells us what happened. He gathered his sons and he said, what are you going to worship after me? And he gave them nasiha. They, when they answered correctly, he was happy. We are going to worship one Allah, the, the Allah that you have taught us all your life. And we will not do this and not, we will not do that. Some of the Israeli riwayats go very deep as to what he said. But what do we learn from that? It's our duty to teach our parents. How many of us as older parents have ever called our teenage children or even the slightly older children, gather them together and full, follow the sunnah of Yaqub alayhi salatu was salam in that and say, look, what, I, I might die tomorrow. What are you people going to do? Are you going to fight with each other about the little wealth that I leave? That's what's happening today. Soon as the father dies, the children are in pieces. May Allah grant us understanding. And may Allah bring us together. And when I said that that glass has milk in it, but one drop of alcohol falls in it, it's all kharab, it's bad. Or one drop of urine falls in it, it's all kharab. Why did I give that example? Because to understand that sometimes you filled milk, but you didn't watch your kids where they went. So outside, remember the impact of the friend of the child is far greater than the impact of the parent of the child generally today. At home you can have a woman who is in full parda. But do you know where she goes? Or you can have a youngster, mashallah, who is hafidhul Quran. Sometimes you find... May Allah save all the Huffad and all those who are even not Huffad, all the youngsters of our Ummah and the boys and the girls. May Allah protect us from drugs and alcohol. And those whom Allah has tested in this, may Allah help them to come out. We need you, we need you. Leave those drugs and come back. We need you. When she goes out, sometimes, and I've seen this myself with my eyes, when I was in London, we were moving and I saw a pub. It was a very big pub and a lady in full parda was walking in. Full parda. And I looked at this Molana, I said, Molana, ye kya ho hai? what's happening here? What's going on? He says, listen, that's what they're doing. These are girls who dress in mini skirts and so on, so that no one recognizes who they are. They cover their face and they walk in. No one knows. No one will ever know who she is. Not even me, not even you. No, not even her parents, even if they come to see here, because she's covered. How cheap people are making the Islamic rulings. And what are we using it for? 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. It's our duty as parents to follow up a little bit. Don't become such policemen that your, your children run away from home. Now you know we are living in an environment that is very different from before. The rulings of Islam still apply. But sometimes you need to think, how do you want to effect those rules in your house? If you are very, very harsh, you will create a cat and mouse relationship in the house. They will be so scared of you. That is not right. Create a love. Today, because I said a few moments ago, the friends of the child have a greater impact than the parents in today's environment. For that reason, oh parents, become the friends of your children also. Your son must be your son and your best friend. And if someone says, who's your best friend? He says, you know, my father is my father's my best friend. If we have that, noorun ala noor, inshallah, because then we solve the problem. But he goes to school, you send him to such a school that the person next to him is on drugs. What is he going to be introduced to? That one drop of urine in the milk. Bus. Then when people see him, they won't say that's a glass of milk. They say, watch out, there's alcohol there. That's the example we've given. So, Sometimes people say, you know, I given my daughter such a good upbringing or my son such a good upbringing. But where did they go wrong? Why is it that this is happening? And normally if you study, you will see that there are two points of upbringing. Internal environment of the home and external environment. We concentrate on internal only. But sometimes we forget to concentrate on external. It is an ibadah to sometimes go out with your children to a place that is jayish to go to. And let them have a recreational afternoon within the limits of Islam with you, oh my dear parent. Because if you don't go, they're going to go with all their friends. And if they go with their friends, you can't guarantee that what they're doing there is not or does not contain that drop of alcohol we spoke about. These are very important issues today. Let's take an active role. Yesterday I spoke and I said, Wallahi. Those of us who are in business or in anything, when we work from six to six and we've never seen our children in our lives, do you think that that's what is required of you as a Muslim parent? Really? That money you are achieving and earning, who are you spending it on? Your own children. Those children really, it's worth more than 10,000 rands a month to have one meal a day with your family. One meal a day. Come early. Cut your working hours. Open your shop at nine, close it at three or four. Bus. That's once you've got to a certain degree. Maybe initially you might have to work hard. But you can't work all your life, six to six. Six to six, your whole life. Your children don't know you. They are 18. Your daughter's ready to get married. She's going to go home and say, you know what? Daddy, I don't really know him. Because he hardly spent any time with me. Weekends he used to go to play golf. And I don't, know if, I don't think golf is a problem here. Because I haven't seen any board saying golf course. I hope it isn't. So, he on the, in the weekends he used to do this and weekdays he was in, at work whole day, I don't really know him. And your sons, what will they do? They'll do the same thing to their children, it will repeat again. We from amongst those who just did whatever we thought, earn, earn and earn and get more and more greedy. I'm not saying it's haram to earn, but I'm saying there are limits to your earning. Spend quality time with your wife and children or your husband and children or your family members or your parents. Wallahi, that is worth. It is priceless, to be honest with you. You can't put a value to that. You really can't. One meal a day is, is, a, is a right. It's not an Islamic right, but it's a social right. One meal a day is a social right. Please, because today, if you are not going to develop the contact with that child, a child has a void. He wants love from somewhere or she wants love from somewhere. If that void is not filled by you, na'udhu billah, it might be filled by the boy who lives opposite the road. Today, someone gave me an example of one of the areas around and told me that there are 20 houses of Muslims and all the girls from here are married to the non-Muslims opposite the road. Wallahi, someone told me just now. It can happen. Why? Because that void of love was filled by the boy next door. She opened the window and saw him every day. Next thing, he took her heart. And who is to blame? Don't say, oh, my whole kharab ho gaya. No, we know it's bad, but we are to blame. Let's take the responsibility and inshallah, do something positive so that we can solve the problems of our ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me firstly the ability and acceptance to take that which was said, which was good and correct, and to leave that which was from shaitan and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala minimize and eradicate our contact with shaitan 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep shaitan away from us and keep us away from shaitan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant our children taraqqi, use them to serve deen and make our offsprings from amongst the champions of deen, those who can serve Islam in one way or another. May Allah use us and our children and our offsprings to come 7, 10, 20 generations down. May Allah keep them on deen. Let's make also dua for those of our children who will come 10 generations down. That Allah keep them on deen also. Those who will be from the army of Isa alayhi salam. If they are our children, let's make dua. Ya Allah, let them be from amongst those who will help Isa alayhi salam. And be from amongst those who will. Let's think very far. Let's build our iman. And we start inshallah here and now. And I'm sure what I've said is just repetition of what we've heard several times. Maybe just in different words. And I told you these words, the vast examples, majority of the examples were inspired by one of the people I really look up to as well, by the name of Mufti Inayat Londoni, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him a long and healthy life. One of the senior khulafa of Mawlana Masihullah Khan sahab rahmatullah alayhi. Let's make a short dua inshallah and then we will read salah. Allahumma salli ala nabina Muhammad wa ala nabina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, we seek forgiveness. Ya Allah, on this day we are asking you to forgive us. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we've committed so many sins that we've lost count of the sins we've committed. Ya Allah, on this day we promise you that we are going to stop these sins we are committing. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, the sins we've been committing for years. Ya Allah, we promise you that we will stop it here and now. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, forgive us. Have mercy on us. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask you for your mercy. Ya Allah, have mercy on us. Have mercy on our wives and children. Ya Allah, on our spouses. Ya Allah, have mercy on our parents. Ya Allah, and our offspring to come. Ya Allah, have mercy on the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ya Allah, safeguard us from all the difficulties that are going on. Ya Allah, today, all the people who are trying to harm us. Ya Allah, you save us from that harm. Ya Allah, the Ummah. Ya Allah, solidify it, Ya Allah. Unite the ulama of this ummah, Ya Allah. Unite the awam of this ummah, Ya Allah. Unite the various peoples of this ummah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you create unity in the hearts. Ya Allah, soften the hearts for goodness, Ya Allah. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Ya Allah, we ask you to make our hearts steadfast on deen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us from amongst those who can be true ummatis of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, grant us the acceptance to respect the ulama, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us from amongst those who can respect and honor the ulama, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us from amongst those who are an asset to our family members and to our families and to our societies and communities and to the ummah at large, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, use us to serve this deen in one way or another. Ya Allah, our offspring, Ya Allah, use them to serve this deen in one way or another. Ya Allah, the generations to come, safeguard them, keep them on deen and use them to serve this deen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, safeguard the ulama of this ummah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the haramain, Ya Allah, safeguard it from the hands of the evil plotters and evil doers, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make hajj easy. Easy for everyone who intends to fulfill Hajj, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, all those who have fulfilled Hajj, accept it from them, Ya Allah. Those who are married, Ya Allah, grant them happiness in their marriages, Ya Allah. Those who do not have offspring from amongst them, Ya Allah, grant them pious offspring. Those who do have offspring, make their offspring the coolness of their eyes, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, those who are not married, grant them spouses who will be the coolness of their eyes, Ya Allah. All those who are sick and ill, Ya Allah, grant them, grant them shifa, kamil ajil, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, all those who are looking after those who are sick and ill, Ya Allah, grant them the reward. The reward that you will grant them, Ya Allah, for looking after those who are sick and ill, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant them the sabr to look after those who are sick and ill, Ya Allah. Help us fulfill our rights towards our parents, Ya Allah. Help us fulfill our rights towards our children, Ya Allah. Help us fulfill our rights to one and all, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, those who have passed away, have mercy on them. Make their graves, gardens from the gardens of paradise, Ya Allah. Do not make them pits from amongst the pits of Jahannam, Ya Allah. The day we pass away, take us away with a smile, Ya Allah. Make sakarat easy for us, Ya Allah. Take us away in such a way that you are happy with us, Ya Allah. Make us better people every day in such a way that the day you take us away, we will be the best, Ya Allah. We will be the closest to you than we ever were, Ya Allah. Take us away with kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah on our tongues the day you take us away, Ya Allah. Let those be the last words, Ya Allah. Grant us Jannah without Hisab Kitab, Ya Allah. Grant us the intercession and shafaat of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, let us drink from the Hawdul Kawthar, Ya Allah, that you have described, Ya Allah, for us. Ya Allah, we ask you on that day to have mercy on us. And Ya Allah, whilst we are in our grave, have mercy on us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, when the angels come to ask us questions, Ya Allah, you help us answer those questions, Ya Allah. If you assist us, Ya Allah, we don't need anyone else, Ya Allah. If you are happy on us on that day with us, you are happy, Ya Allah. We don't need anyone else to be happy, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the day we are in our graves, 
and the darkness of the grave may overtake us. Ya Allah, you save us from that darkness by enlightening our graves with the nur of Iman, Ya Allah. And with the nur that you will use to enlighten those graves, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make our graves as well gardens from amongst the gardens of paradise and save our graves from having scorpions in them and having snakes in them, Ya Allah. And save our graves, Ya Allah, from becoming narrow for us, Ya Allah. The narrowness that you have described, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the day that we will die, Ya Allah, we will not be able to move our fingers, Ya Allah, on that day of mercy on us, Ya Allah. When they wash our bodies, we will not be able to utter whether the water is cold or hot. Ya Allah, have mercy on us on that day, Ya Allah. When they enshroud us with a coffin and take us to the Qabrastan, Ya Allah, have mercy on us on that day, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, when Salatul Janazah is read on us and they lift us and put us into our graves and cover us with that soil, Ya Allah, have mercy on us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we require mercy now and then, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, have mercy on all of us, Ya Allah. We ask you to safeguard the women of this Ummah, Ya Allah. We ask you to safeguard the youth of this Ummah, Ya Allah. The children of this Ummah, the men of this Ummah, this entire Ummah at large, Ya Allah. Safeguard us all. The enemies of Islam, Ya Allah, guide them to Islam. Soften their hearts so that they can become Muslims, Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, if you have not written guidance for them, Ya Allah, and if they intend evil against us, Ya Allah, then you save us from their evil in whatever way you feel fit. Allahumma kfinahum bima shi'ta ya dal jalali wal ikram. Ya Allah, make us strong with our salah. Ya Allah, make us steadfast with our five salah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us strong so we can leave sins such as zina, such as alcohol, such as drugs, such as gambling, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us from amongst those who can leave who can leave jealousy and deception. And Ya Allah, purify our hearts. Let us love one another, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make this ummah pure, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us all pure on this day, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, be happy with us on this day. Ya Allah, we know that whenever we call out to you, Ya Allah, you answer the call positively, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, this day we have raised our hands to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to have mercy on us on this day, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we know that you have answered our call, Ya Allah. Let us feel the rahmah. Ya Allah, let us feel your blessings and barakat upon us today, Ya Allah. And every day, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to... Guide our parents and to safeguard them at all times, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, make our parents from amongst those whom you use to serve deen. Ya Allah, give them good health if they are alive, Ya Allah. And for those whose parents have passed away, <coughs> Ya Allah, grant them Jannah. Grant them Maghfira, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant them Maghfira. All those who have accepted Islam recently, Ya Allah, make them strong so that they don't turn back, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us all strength so that we don't turn back on our deen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, on our achievements, we don't turn back, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you all the goodness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has asked, Ya Allah. And we seek protection from all the evil that he has sought protection from. Ya Allah, we ask you to help those Muslims who are suffering on the globe, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we are with them, Ya Allah. We feel their pain, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the Mujahideen, wherever they are, whoever they are, you know better than us where they are and what they are doing, Ya Allah. Help them wherever they are, Ya Allah. The Muslim Ummah, Ya Allah, bring us together. Ya Allah, safeguard us from all evil. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim. Wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawabu al-rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-musalina wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alim.